Hello and welcome to another episode of Go To Unscripted. We're here in the lovely city of Copenhagen for Go To Copenhagen. My name is Julian Wood. I am a developer advocate who works in the serverless team at AWS, and I'm joined by the lovely Jessica, who's working for Launch Darkly. How are you, Jessica? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing very good. We are actually both live in London, but now we're in Copenhagen for a few days. So. Exactly. Have you been before? I haven't. No, this is my first time in oh. Copenhagen. It's a beautiful city, and I'm really excited about the venue. It's really cool seeing the big screens in and everything, cinema, yeah. isn't it? In have you cinema. had a Danish yet? That's the. I have not had a Danish Danish. <laughs> Danish and sandwiches. I know. Always keep talking about the food before <laughs> coming to any place, really. Yeah. Um, <clears> but I wanted to ask you. Mm. I'll kick things off with, with. I mean, talk. Let's let's talk about serverless. What if? Yeah. What is serverless? Yeah. So serverless is. A bit of a weird term because, um, as with cloud, uh, it can be meaningless and it can mean a whole lot of things. <laughs> but the idea of being serverless is that you manage your applications without having to look after any servers or any pods or any clusters or anything kind of like that. So you don't have any infrastructure to manage. That's mm -hmm. a sort of operational ideal of having to have as little infrastructure to manage. Get AWS to look after all that for you so you don't have to, you know, rack servers, never mind doing that, you're doing that in the mm -hmm. cloud, but you don't have to patch operating systems, you don't even have to patch your language runtimes. Uh, so it just, uh, it's far more secure and far more um, simple from that operational aspect. Also, the other benefit of serverless is scale. Mm -hmm. um, we handle all the scaling for you, so you don't need to, you know, add things behind a load balancer. You can scale up as big as you need, really, and also as small as you need. So one of the big tenets of serverless is that if you're not using any service, you don't pay for anything. So you really pay for the value, and that's the sort of useful part of it. And yes, it is a sort of new way to build applications, but. Um, Part of the reason I joined AWS was I, I came from an infrastructure background. I could see that this is just the way that applications are going to are, are going to be built. And yeah, so this is a, just a great way to be able to um, build more modern applications. Oh, fantastic. So coming from an infrastructure background, did you kind of see the change in tide when it came to people planning their architectures, how they they structured applications? Yes, um, and that's it because people are used to these sort of traditional three-tier applications yeah. and they've got a, you know, a database and some sort of processing tier and then a web tier. And you know, from two perspectives, and I did mention the scale before. If something needs to scale up, well, you know, you've got a replicated database tier, or you've got lots of different compute nodes, or a, a web front end, and you know, you have a sale comes on, or uh, <coughs> something happens, and you know, how do you manage that scale? And you land up paying for the peak, uh, paying for peak mm. when you're not really using that. <coughs> and then the other perspective was, well, when things aren't happening, and on, on a weekend you've got applications that are not being used, or uh, you've got development environments that are not being used, and you're just paying for that. Uh, uh, unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. And also the other benefit of serverless is sort of handing over control and sort of resting control of some of the things, what we call un undifferentiated heavy lifting. So things like uh, patching servers and managing all that kind of thing, just let somebody else do that because that's not your core competency uh, for yeah. any business. So rather focus on your business logic and the way that your application is going to integrate with different kind of things. And that is what is new with serverless and that's the kind of thing people need to learn as a new architectural practice is, okay, how am I going to connect these different services together? And then, sure, I'm going to have my own code that I'm going to run and that's my uh, that's my business logic but yeah I know you've done a lot of work on architectural practices what have you been seeing you know working with a company that is you know feature flags and seeing how applications are modernizing yeah I think the um, the biggest thing I've, I've been seeing is um, people kind of questioning why they're necessarily engaging in a practice um, I'll never forget reading uh, recently read um, one of Sam Newman's books that was talking yep. about microservices and he um, ha had this brilliant anecdote which talked about how he's running this workshop and six people came along and he was like, why are you here? This is, thanks so much for coming. And he was like, well, you know, we were told to be here and we were told we we're doing microservices. And there, was, there wasn't that sort of engagement with the, yeah. with, with the, with the why aspect. Um, and I think that's something that's um, maybe like a trend that's spotted recently. Like yeah. people kind of t potentially looking at uh, the advantages of maybe like a modular monolith or, yeah. or sort of stepping away from the hype of a, of a technology trend potentially. Um, but uh, I find microservice-based architectures interesting because obviously you can, um, with the advent of feature flags, you can stage a service behind a feature and you can truly delegate that responsibility it can be surfaced in an environment that everyone can truly access um, that can be integrated maybe with your Slack instance so you can change a flag in Slack. It can be hooked up to your observability platform. So say if you um, fall below a certain SLO, you can notice what's going wrong, see what's yeah. going wrong and, and change that. And uh, it just I think having that level of control and truly distributed responsibility can 
lead to like happier teams. Yeah. I like your framing of that because I think I always tell people, especially because serverless can be seen as a sort of newer way to build applications, mm-hmm. that people think, oh, I must be serverless or I must be containers or I must be Kubernetes or I must be anything. Yes. And I always say, I always say to people, don't change anything unless you've got a real sort of architectural need you need to, you're bumping up against. And that mm-hmm. may be cost, that may be availability, that may be scale or that kind of thing. But I always say, you know, for funsies, don't just go and change <laughs> your app because, you know, you're going to come out of that without also learning about what you're, what you're going to be doing. Mm-hmm. But I know, you know, at least from the feature flags, when you are... One of the things with the and a monolith is all fine. I mean, I, I will never say that a monolith is bad. If it's all working for you, absolutely fine. Um, but when you start bumping up against something, maybe it's going to be scale or cost, as I said. You then going to as soon as you start breaking things apart for good reason, you then got something that's distributed. And I know because uh, I work with serverless services, something like uh, AWS Lambda, which is compute in the cloud. Mm-hmm. So you just literally upload a zip file or a container image, and we will run your code up to ridiculous scale, all down to, to zero. But within that code, you've obviously got different code paths that people want to do, and they want to reason about that. And so, um, you know, from a serverless compute perspective, feature flags are sort of a, a super important thing of it because you also, when you're using the cloud, you also don't have knowledge and visibility into how the rest of the cloud infrastructure is happening. Mm-hmm. And so you want to reason about your production applications, you want to test in production, mm-hmm. and feature flags is the, is the sort of super way to do it. So how, how are you seeing people sort of evolve their architectures for distributed computing? I've, I think the, the typical path that I've, I've seen so far has been um, people engage with us in a super, it, they start engaging with us on the client side with, um, with uh, augmenting their UIs, just standard A-B testing. But um, they obviously need to develop at scale, um, speed up their processes and we sometimes um f- and we often find ourselves um becoming that sort of um essential middleware for people to yeah. to work with um so that's the kind of general sort of like journey of seeing of people um uh, uh implementing launch darkly deeper than their stack um i think things are starting to get slightly more interesting when uh i think there's a lot to be done more in terms of um the um Maybe like altering. Um, this is very much a wish list and a co- that something that isn't very li- isn't live at the moment. But um, uh, I think we could maybe do some more interesting implementation at the infrastructure level. Yeah. Like it's wild that you have to completely rerun an instance when yeah. you change something. So. Yes. Yeah, so and be, obviously. <clears throat> so be smarter with what your feature flags can give mm. you. So so how does launch darkly then? work from a code perspective. You obviously mm-hmm. got a, a piece of code and it reaches out to launch darkly mm-hmm. to get, I suppose, a, a, a value that then mm-hmm. you can use in your code to you know, go down this path or display a widget on the screen or you know, update a, one database or another database. Yeah, how does sort of launch darkly and your code fit together? So we create um, two types of SDKs um, uh, in about 30 different languages and they're very like, language-specific SDKs. You reference us like a library within your code, okay. um, implement us in the sort of either in like an if-else or a ternary statement. Mm. Um, so it's right there in your repository and uh, we reach out to we have a flag delivery network, almost like a CDN style oh, yeah. um, distribution where uh, your application will reach out and um, your flag will evaluate or open a streaming or polling session. And uh, depending on the evaluation, you'll get a different flag resolved. Um, and it's really useful because I guess if you, uh, if for whatever reason your application goes offline um, or um, your application isn't able to reach the uh, FDN, you'll resolve to your else statement. So it makes rolling back gracefully a little bit more of a sort of conscious decision, which is good. Okay, and I, I suppose the bigger picture I, d- I didn't ask about was the <clears throat> the point of feature flags is that you can, one of the points of feature flags, I, as I understand it, is you could have one you know, huge production application mm-hmm. and you want to test out a new feature for you know, 1% of your users or even five users. And then you would uh, amend your code, use this feature flag and mm-hmm. say, um, you know, when it's, uh, when it's you know, five different people in your team are accessing this particular website, then do X, Y, and Z. And that, mm-hmm. that would happen. And then once you get confident, mm-hmm. you could then roll that out and that would just be changing a flag in your if-then statement saying, well, you know, 5,000 people and then you know, hopefully your business is good and it's 50 million people using your mm-hmm. new Exactly. And then that can iterate all, you know, I suppose that means that you can deploy more quickly because you're, you know that your production code is running in production and you can just ramp up and down 
uh, the different features that people are using. Yeah, pre precisely. And you can also build out your, um, you know, we're talking about users, but we're kind of talking about contexts, really. It, it could be, your user could be um, more of a, an endpoint and your, you could define a particular um, a uh, particular pathway, like a particular use case. Um, it becomes, I think, super interesting when you look at um, safeguarding your application against um, uses that it shouldn't be used for. Okay. So uh, there's one particular use case I love um, where someone um, uh, consents nefarious use of their application mm. and return like a like a 404 for that one person and everyone still gets their 200s. And okay. still. And I suppose it must be really quick because that sort of code checking is literally front end to the website so yep. you can you know roll out the, this kind of check or block a particular user mm -hmm. or enable a particular user yeah, really quickly yeah and then as, yes carry on oh no i was, <coughs> was going to say if we're talking about what people should and shouldn't do i wondered whether or not you have any sort of should or shouldn'ts for for serverless for serverless yes i think um as with all architectural decisions mm -hmm. it's not biting off more than you can handle or more right. than you can chew um <clears throat> i think Serverless has a huge amount of benefits, and I think the, the as with all things cloud, let alone serverless, is to just start small and uh, and iterate and play. And that's one of the big benefits of serverless is because you pay for only what you use. Mm -hmm. If a developer is exploring a new way to do something, they are literally paying uh, you know hardly anything to use it. I mean, in fact, for for Lambda, you get a million free invocations every month. So <clears throat> that's just and they're. Big, and that's across a lot of serverless services where there's a generous free tier that you can just explore mm. and see how that, that can happen. And so a very common way that people are doing, and if we are talking about web applications, is to, a lot of people run their own um, web servers, and so they're going to use, you know, Apache or Nginx or this kind of thing. And, and a good sort of serverless way is, well, you know, why are you going to manage that complexity of uh, a big cluster to handle all your web requests? You could use a managed service like API Gateway, mm -hmm. which just allows you to, outsource a lot of that API management and still have a lot of the control. Mm -hmm. Then behind that, you're going to still run your own code because obviously you've got to return stuff to your users. And AWS Lambda is a super good use case for that. And again, it's not going to scale. You're just going to upload your code, you know, any language you can think of un uh, under the sun, and that is uh, and that that thing going to be able to to use that. And the cool thing is, you could use you could have a website with uh, many different languages because a, a lambda function is a just small, discrete piece of code. Uh, it's very easy to reason out, reason about. Uh, it's built in, connected to the rest of AWS in terms of security. So you know, really secure and sort of simple way, uh, simple way that you you can do that. Um, and so that, that's where I would start from a web uh, from a web background. If you're doing data processing, another super use case for serverless, where people have a you know, vast amount of data, and it could be streaming data, it could be event data, mm -hmm. it could be d data you want to pull off a queue. Uh, again, you can run some compute, and you can, uh, with Lambda, for example, there we've got polars that just we run on your behalf, so you don't have to have a container or an EC2 instance grabbing messages off the queue. We'll handle that all for you, and you just concentrate on your, uh, on your, uh, on your business logic. Nice. So that's where I'd, uh, I'd say to start. There's, a, there's actually a website, serverlessland.com, um, really good website to just explore and find out the different use cases. Um, the reason I'm actually here at Go to Copenhagen is mm -hmm. we put a, a coffee bar called Serverless Espresso. Nice. And actually, you get a cool free coffee uh, at the end of it. But it's a way to explore how you can use uh, serverless architectures and actually the sort of important bits of using some sort of orchestration and choreography. So it's you know there's a bit of a microservices story into that. There's a, an event-driven story into that with event-driven architectures and how it all ties together to build a I suppose what would be a modern application and we're using the sort of hook of getting some free uh, uh, coffee out of it. So yeah, we're actually doing that here at, uh, um, at GoTo, and we've done it at a number of GoTo's this year, which is super good. But that just made me think, something that's, I know that's near and dear to your heart is the complexity story. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about how we disaggregate things, and I know people in the back of my mind is going, hang on, this, uh, <laughs> this is getting complicated and complex. Yes. Well, yeah, what what are your thoughts on software that? Software gets complicated really fast, doesn't it? Yep. I mean, it's... it's I, I, think, I think it's... Um, I can't remember. I, th I think it was, um, was it the founder of uh, the the um, the originator of the BDD concepts was talking about software getting complicated. It was almost like a form of entropy. It's it's, yeah, it's inevitable. Um, uh, I, I I love a good abstraction. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's that's what we're about. Um, and I think there's the always the. I mean, I, I've I've absolutely loved getting involved in the DevOps scene. And I think it's very interesting looking at the combination of people and process and how that comes together. But obviously where 
it can be so tempting to do something in a cool way just because that's the... Yeah, the new hotness. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, I mean, when it comes to computer science, you've got to look at a, a solution that is applicable and appropriate and complete for the for the, for the use case and, and is the best use of performance. Um, so um, I'm quite excited about a session that I'm running tomorrow about um, how to avoid the temptation of over-engineering a solution, uh, which is something that I'm always trying to learn myself. So if you have any tips, please hit me up. For, uh, that, that should be coming up soon. Um, but in terms of uh, learning how to do things in an efficient way. We've also launched um, academy.launchdarkly.com, which is a fun uh, course that you can kind of work through um, with a couple of uh, nice little replit examples, getting you going with your first feature flag. Um, so uh, I think that's a good practical, tangible example of how to it. keep things <laughs> simple and uh, manageable and to manage that scalability. Mm. Which so what, happen. based on your talk, not to give too much away, but what, what are the sort of kind of tips that you would give people? Because there are some new ways of doing things that are mm. going to be great and then some other things which may not be great. And some of that's going to be, you know, people talk about resume-driven development where you're just trying to learn something to stick it on your CV so you can get your next job. So I know <laughs> that there's, you know, sometimes a, a push for that. But yeah, what, what tips would you give people to manage, handle that complexity and to decide what they should invest their own time in and their company's time in? Um, I... I think remembering that a lot of the solutions that we're trying to implement are inherently communication in themselves. Code is a order of instructions. Architecture is a is a some order of service. It's it's that we have uh, a lot of communication methods that we don't necessarily traditionally think of as communication methods. Um, so I think working with the environments that we really have um, to I know everyone talks about minimising context switching, but I think we all know being advocates that context switching can eat away at your time very yep. easily. So um, you know, working with the environments that you have and uh, remembering that um, the solutions that we are already invested in can probably work harder for us. So maybe um, looking at ways that we can maybe integrate what we want to do into our existing so is, patterns. So is that a story there of sort of not reinventing the wheel and not getting over complex, but using the systems you maybe already have uh, available to you, uh, which will integrate. And I suppose that's from a technology point of view, different parts of your application integrating, mm -hmm. but also with people and being able to, you know, communicate and, and develop applications with teams of other people. I suppose in, you know, in COVID times, these people are all across the world mm -hmm. on the other side of a Zoom call or, or somewhere, which makes it harder. Precisely. And uh, I think there was uh, one of last year's State of DevOps reports was talking about the importance of being able to define our communication patterns, which sounds like such an obvious thing on the surface. But uh, I think there's a reason why... Um, distributed systems are favoured because I think that distributed sense of responsibility leads to a better working environment and potentially um, defining our organisational patterns is a good way to be able to replicate that in a, in a, in a repeatable, scalable way. So um, that's going to be one of the methods that could be uh, one of the measures I'm going to be advocating for. That and also uh, leveraging your um, a good observability platform. Uh, yeah, very important. Right. Specifically so, for serverless and distributed applications. Exactly. And when you're using something like LaunchDarkly, you need to know exactly what's going on and where. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Definitely. I think I am quite excited to try one of your serverless espressos, though. Oh, so. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, we're going to... Oh, yeah, well, you're more than welcome to come over, yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us here for GoTo Unscripted. It was uh, awesome to be able to chat to Jessica. We'll have to meet up in London, which will be much closer. Definitely. But we'll certainly enjoy Copenhagen uh, at the time. Uh, so for people who we have met here at GoTo Copenhagen, thanks so much for coming. We're certainly going to go and enjoy a coffee, but thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Cheers.